witty comment. you guys it's good to see you it's good to be seen by you welcome back to the show everyone it's thursday i'm bill sylvie the dungeon delver and you ain't but if you're like me you're six feet tall and you're named bill um so we've got some stuff going on tonight jack is having some audio issues so hopefully he can get those resolved and we'll be rolling in uh happy thursday to you too uh, xantharian the wheeling dragon michael dale calvinoni uh, it's one of my favorite things to have at an Italian restaurant, by the way. Some nice uh, Calvinoni with some bolognese on it. Delicious. Anyway, um, Kabuki Kid. Hello, you, darling. How are you? Um, I think I said Mercury Wells already. And if I didn't, Mercury Wells. Tall Aaron. Timothy Imholtz hanging out with us tonight. Maybe, possibly. But anyway... I hope everyone is doing absolutely fine. I, I I can't complain, the Wheeling Dragon. I'd say I can't complain, but who because who'd listen? But you guys would. You have to. You're stuck. I mean, you could close the YouTube tab or turn your phones off. But whatever. Anyway. Um, so it's Thursday. We've made it to Thursday. It is Friday Eve. Happy Friday Eve, everyone. Um and I'm I'm glad you're all here watching the show. All eight tune of you, eight eight tune, all eight tune of you, all eight tune, all eighteen of you. And folks, if you haven't already, please click the subscribe button. Please click the bell icon for notifications. If you like what you see here, give it a thumbs up, and leave a comment down below and tell me what you like about it. If you don't like it. Give it a thumbs down and leave me a comment below and tell me what you didn't like about it. And I'll do more or less of the things you like or don't like, or at least I'll try to. If the things you don't like is you being on the internet, well, I can't help you there. But I'll certainly try and make your time here a little bit better. So um, that is... Uh, that is, that is that is me and that is what's going on. But this live stream is brought to you by our friends at Hellebard Games. Hellebard makes the kind of adventures they'd like to play, whether it's for Castles and Crusades, for 5th edition, or for the OSR. Old School is in play at the table with Hellebard Games, and you can find them at DriveThruRPG or on their website, hellebardgames.com. They are linked in the comments below so uh jack can hear me on youtube but not in Streamyard. that's no good that's no good that's no good that's no good jack that's no good see if you have that tab muted jack um or you know we'll make it work. Uh, we'll make it work. It's because Jack hasn't sent a super yet. A hundred dollars. You said I cannot guarantee that, and I I wouldn't hate it. But um, yeah, hopefully uh, Jack will get his audio issues resolved. And by the way, so um, I, I this is not a confession. Um, the, this this is not a. Uh, um, like I'm a come to Jesus moment. I'm begging your forgiveness. It is what it is. I do my thumbnails like sometimes right when I'm putting stuff up on socials and for quick and easy thumbnails, a little bit of AI splash is what I use because I don't have a design team. I am me. You guys know that. Um, but I had, I had a, a really difficult time because I thought, 
I'm going to do a thing. I'm going to uh, ask uh, uh, bing.com slash create. I'm going to ask, hey, Big Yehuda, good to see you. <laughs> hey, just 98 more bucks and I'll fix Jack's audio problems. I kid, I kid. Uh, Jack, try it. Try like a hard refresh on your browser, buddy. Um, but anyway, uh, no, I said to the generative AI, a cartoony wizard working at a printing press, wearing a Star Trek outfit, being interviewed for a podcast. Because I thought, what better describes Jack Photon? He is a wizard. He, he, he does his own printing stuff. And he loves Star Trek. So I threw that at it, and so it just, it tried. Bless its heart, it tried so hard. And eventually I took the cartoony out and it gave me what you got in the thumbnail tonight. And so so that's that's what we got. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I, I did my level best. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the generative AI thing because I think every artist we've had on has at best been very circumspect on the subject. Um, if I had the money for an art team, and this is not a hostage situation, guys, I'm not saying... You know, if you people paid me more, I, I love the support that I get from you guys. Um, then uh, I would, I would unquestionably, um, I, I, I would unquestionably have an art team set up. But um, the, uh, you know, for for just the the one off thumbnails. I could not bust chops and tell somebody I'm going live in an hour. I want a four color, blah, 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 blah. Um, which is one reason. And, and I think it's, you know, Kabuki kid, I completely understand. Um, uh, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, So that's why I tend to try and shy away from like not photorealistic. I think it blending photographic elements like it did with uh with the um the the image I have now uh I I I think you know that that's uh, again it's it's just piecing stuff together. Um, but I will say this, I will, I, 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 myself, I won't illustrate a book with it. Like I, I, I would never publish a book and say, look at this great art that I created. So Jack says live shows are not the time to find bad audio. They aren't, <laughs> they are not, um, the only other thing I can recommend, Jack, is like a is like a full reboot, buddy. But uh, I I hope Kabuki that 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 you're you're not you're not going to leave me, are you? You're not you're not going to walk out that door. Um, yeah, and you know I'm not again, I'm not advocating for AI art. I make my thumbnails with it. That's it. I don't, you know, I don't make modules with it. I don't, I, the now very late uh, backers modules for, for January and February, I could, I could probably knock them out in 15 minutes with chat GPT, but I'm not going to do that. Um, oh, that's no good, Jack. That's no good at all. Okay. As long as you see quietly in the corner and just watch the awesomeness. But hopefully Jack's audio issues will be cleared up in a minute. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jack. I know Jack. Um, 
about Jack. No. Uh, let me let me tell you guys a little bit. So so Jack started watching the show and um he he was all about Star Trek. I think I did my first let's create a Star Trek character show in the middle of the day when I was still doing uh early, early afternoon um uh live streams. Uh, and Jack, you, you say in the chat, Jack, because you're you're here, you're kind of here. Let me know in the chat. Did you catch the very first Let's Make a Fossa Star Trek character show that I did once upon a time? Um, because we we did that on the show, and shortly thereafter, Jack showed up and started being a regular contributor. Uh, out there to the crowd and talking about that. And then eventually I was like, well, we're just, you know, we, we just got to have you on the show. But even before that, Jack was sending me beautiful pieces of art. And if my walls were not covered with bookshelves, I would have more Jack photon art up. Now you guys, um, let me, you know what? Let's, let's let the art speak for itself. This is the Librum of Gameful Conjurations. Now look at that at the distance I have it at. And tell me if this is not something that you would have seen on a hobby store shelf back in 1978. And look at this. This is, this is a, a canvas cover. Okay. Now the bookmark gives it away. Even, even uh, at Gary's insistence, I don't think TSR would have done that. But uh, this is no more searching, you know, th this is basically, it's the, the splash from the back of the player's handbook, but it's got this beautiful art done by him on the front. And this is, um, this, this is a, a compilation of character classes, not just from the player's handbook, but from Unearthed Arcana. Jack put this together in this glorious, glorious deluxe set. And I, I absolutely love this. Um, all I can suggest, Jack, is maybe just a cold reboot. Just take your PC or your Mac or phone or whatever all the way down and bring it all the way back up. Or you could try to join us on your phone. Not call me on the phone, but rather, uh, you know, join the, the stream yard on your phone. But this is an amazing book, and I gave away a few of these last year, and Jack will put these up for sale um, on uh, uh, sometimes on eBay, and there are PDFs of this available on the Internet Archive, and these, these are awesome. This is what, when we were kids and we used to make our own classes and our own little D&D &D books, and we'd stick them in Mead folders and, and write them in loose leaf notebooks and stuff. This is what we imagined our books could be someday. This is what we imagined uh, that, that, that our stuff might look like. And this, this is a hardback. That is just one of the amazing volumes that Jack has done. And again, if you want one of those and you're, and you're just like, yeah, I'll email you someday, Bill, about getting it. That window is closed. That ship is sailed because I have a bunch to give away for Guac three. There will be a Guac three drawing. You must be in the audience on the live stream. You must be here. Uh, Daniel Rowan says, Photon me. We are fighting some audio issues. Jack will be here shortly. I hope. Um, but let me see. Where are... Oh, gosh. I feel like that's right there on the bookshelf by my bed. Because I was looking at them the other night. Dang it. In anticipation of the show. There are other books that Jack has made. They are amazing. And when they become available, you've got to, you've got to, got to get them. Um, so let me see. Oh, and lest I forget, the guy's not just about d and I mean, it says right there in his name, Jack Photon. Um, 
he has made an absolutely amazing set of Star Trek the role-playing game books. This is Fossa Star Trek, by the way. I'm just kind of grabbing one at random. Star Trek, a game for role-playing adventures in the original series, as was back when. And this is a piece of the action, mostly shipboard, living, and planetary adventuring. Mostly. So again, this is, this is a high-quality volume. It is loaded with art from the original series, from the cartoon, um, which, by the way, I don't know about you guys. I absolutely, I absolutely consider uh, the Star Trek animated series as just season four of the original series. It is no more or less goofy than, than uh, the original series. Okay. Uh, ma make sure you are, are logged out on your computer first, Jack. I liked the cartoon a lot, but anyway, this is the kind of stuff that, that Jack gets up to. And it is, it is amazing. I have, where's my, where's my Fossa Star Trek box set? Here it is. So I inherited this. I inherited this from a dearly departed friend. May he rest in peace. And it was complete, save for the star maps. A set of loose star maps from Fossa costs more than a box. It's nuts. It's completely bonkers. So, yeah, I didn't have the maps. And I just casually mentioned this. Oh, it'd be nice to have the star maps. Jack sent me the star maps. He's just a great guy, okay? He's just a great guy. And he's he's been a fan of and a supporter of this show. Vaughn will sing his praises from the, the uh, highest heights. Um, the Librem of Gameful Conjurations, Exalted NPCs, and the Book of Finite Spells are all on eBay. Um... So yeah, yeah. If you if you can get your hands on uh, Jack's books, then do so. Again, we're going to have a drawing, and there's going to be Jack Photon art. There's going to be Jack Photon books up for grabs. And if you miss out, if I if I draw your name, if I call your name in the live stream. I, you know, I can't do nothing for you. But what Jack is working on right now is, um, well, you know what? We're going to hope that Jack's going to be able to, to, to get logged in. Uh, we're going to wait for just a few more minutes. Um, Michael Dale says, only 16 people are enjoying themselves so far, huh? Like, 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 thank you very much. So, um, yeah, we're, we're going to... I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to how to get names there. Um, Jack Fonton. I I see him coming in there. Hopefully he'll do it. Anyone know where you can get uh, the AD and D Goldenrod player kit? Yes, I do. Daniel Rowan. I absolutely do. While we're waiting for Jack to to get uh, to get hooked up, I will get you that. Um, and this is really awesome because this is a fillable PDF, and then all you have to do is put Goldenrod paper through your printer of choice, but dig this. Pipe. Well, let's see. I, I am, I'm going to drop the link. Relax. So let's see. Oh, they also have Star Trek uh, FASA character sheets over there too. Um, but I'm going to send you guys, I'm going to share the, um, the exact link. So go here and get these. Go here and get these. And I'll share it real quick. I'll show you guys the link. 
Check screen, share screen. So there you go. You guys can see those are the goldenrod sheets right there. And again, these are fillable PDFs. And even if you like the Ref2 sheets better that have comeliness and so on and et cetera, um, he's got those. And as I mentioned, he he also has, uh, where where is it? Where is it? Star Trek, Star Trek. Boss of Star Trek character sheets. Boom. Right there. Right there. Well, there you go, Daniel Rowan. And you can print to your heart's delight. These are not fuzzy scans. The guy created these from scratch. He just, he just brought them up from scratch. So I see Jack in, in, uh, I'm going to try something here. I'm going to kick your original login from studio. So I have removed your studio login, Jack, and I see your phone login to studio is still there. But it's awesome. He's, I think, has he got original D&D character sheets? Let's see. He's got, he's got basic. Yeah, yeah. So so he's got um he's got the basic sheet. Your phone log in, the mic is muted, the desk desktop mic works. What a cluster majiggle. Wait, your desktop mic is working? Well, okay, volcano god, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> you know where I am. Volcano God used to be proximate to me, but he's, uh, well, he's not now. Um, all right, I'm going to try, we're going to try, I'm going to add Jack to stage and we're going to see if we can hear him. And I'm going to, uh, oh, I'm going to unshare that because this isn't Jack stuff. That's not what we're talking about tonight. Um, Jack, are you there? I can hear no Jack. I do not hear Jack. All right, so we'll we'll hope that uh, Jack is uh, is is able to to get his his audio working. I pro it's not me this time, guys. I promise. I promise it's not me this time. I know we've had rafts of audio problems in the past. Maybe it's like a clap. Uh, um, you, you know, like if everybody in the audience claps. So, you know, we'll we'll try that. Jack says, nope, it was working. Uh, let me do this. Yes, I know. I don't want to ban him. I just wanted to remove that. You know what's funny is I used to like if you go back. Oh, this is this is uh, actually fairly important. I want to share this while we're waiting for Jack. Speaking of Jacks and Johns and and all that sort of thing, um, there is a playlist now. There is a playlist, um, and I hate the thumbnail for it, but there's there's not much I can do about that. Um, but there is now a playlist for all the interviews I did with Jim Ward. And there is the link. That is like seven hours of chatting with the late, great Jim Ward. I know listening to my live streams can be uh, an experience. I will say three words where one would have worked. 
I have more pauses than a pinter play. My voice is about as pleasant to listen to as your car's water pump going bad. But Jim was an absolutely amazing guest. He was like guest three, I think. It was like uh, Lance Hovermail, Darlene, Jim. And then I, I think uh, Rob Schwalb, or Rob Schwalb may have been three and Jim was four. But he always said yes. Whenever I invited him on the show, he always said yes. Except once, I think for the show's uh, second anniversary, was it the second anniversary? No, uh, it was the first anniversary. I think he misunderstood when I said, hey, I'm doing a 24-hour live stream. Do you want to join me? I think he thought I meant, do you want a live stream for 24 hours? um so uh yeah he's jack photon not jack sound wave you can only see him not hear him um <clears throat> so jim was absolutely awesome and the thing about it is i have a lot of interviews that i did that are buried deep on Facebook, you come and find me on YouTube and you can find any video I've done on, on just about any topic by searching my, my YouTube channel, look for keywords. Uh, Google will help you find it. The, the video, despite the fact that I have 900 videos. Um, but you, you can't like pull up a video on Facebook from years ago that Facebook didn't just randomly vomit up and recommend. Good luck. I'll wait for you here. Um, so, uh, so we, um, you know, we, we, do what we can if we're stuck on Facebook. But when I got over to YouTube, I found uh, a tool called fdown, fdown.net. If you want to download videos off of YouTube, you're like, or off of uh, off of uh, Facebook, like, oh, that's a really cool video. Or I made that video and I want it. Just use fdown. Just copy and paste the, the actual video URL into fdown and download it. And that's what I did. And they're now available for you guys um, and I've got, uh, all four of them are available for you guys to watch. And so I hope you enjoy them. Um, ah, we'll, we'll keep hoping. We'll keep hoping, Jack. You can't hear StreamYard. That is, that is so strange. I, I, I don't know why you're using, you're using a Mac or a PC. <laughs> It's quite the conundrum. So I'm doing my show, and I said to my buddy Jack, you want to be on the show? And he says to me, yeah. So I give him the time, and I tell him, you got to log in. I was having audio issues, all kinds of stuff with the microphone. So my question to you, sorry, that's all the Christopher Walken I got. Meanwhile, anything I would want to show is on your desktop and the internet archive. Um, I think he has tried to reboot uh, Kabuki, but... Anyway, uh, Volcano God, we Volcano God and I have talked about this, the Mount Rushmore of Dungeons and Dragons. And yes, um, Ward, uh, of course, Gary, of course, I'm going to go and I, I'm going to, I'm going to say something, uh, kind of unpopular maybe. Um, and I'm going to say Tom Moldvay. So many hundreds of thousands of basic with Tom Moldvay. And then I think that said, my number four, I would have to probably put 
because we've already got Gary and Jim and Tom. I, you know, I'm going to say, hmm. I'm going to get in trouble for this. I'm going to get in trouble for this. Uh, but it's not going to be Dave Arneson. It's not going to, it's, it's not going to be Dave Arneson. Um, I'm going to have to go with an artist and that artist is, is going to be, uh, Errol Otis. Um, Errol Otis's stuff was iconic and I almost feel like I should not, uh, I, I, I should not be um, listing an artist. Like there should be an artist, a D&D artist Mount Rushmore. In fact, let's do that. Let's take Errol and put him over on the D&D artist Mount Rushmore. And then that, of course, is is uh, Errol Trampier, uh, Sutherland, and, uh, and Darlene. Um, but a, a, uh, the fourth... Uh, you know what, Dave Cook. Dave Cook. That's what I'll go with. I will go with Dave Cook. Um, because Dave Cook worked on Moldvay Basic with Tom Moldvay and did a lot of the the lifting on Expert. So that that is it. That is it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Mount Rushmore is a top four, Daniel. So, I, I mean, if I'm going to name, I, I'm going to say every artist that worked on Dungeons and Dragons all the way to the end of second edition. Yeah. With a couple of exceptions. Uh, so do you guys remember back in the fall when my dear friends at Gods and Monsters gave me the stack? Well, there was a first edition, or rather there was a, there was uh, a second edition monster man or a, a second edition player's handbook and a second edition dungeon master's guide. And there is a lot like the dungeon master's guide and maybe the player's handbook. Um, but the dungeon master's guide has color plates in it by, by Elmore and Caldwell. And they are just. Mwah. Um. But there's a couple of like blue and white stylized drawings that are bad. They're just not good. Uh, now, Tim, I, I've already told you uh, over over on Twitter. We've already talked about the uh, the the Dungeons and Dragons traveling Wilburys, my friend. I saw. I I actually saw your um your uh. Your your link, Michael, um, over uh, over on um, Twitter about that. Those, those were those were really cool. The traveling Wilburys of monsters. Yeah, we'll have to do that. Uh, all right, I'm going to see if we've got Jack on now. Jack, can you hear us? Mm. Still nothing from Jack. Still nothing. Edge blocks your mic and camera, but you can hear me. Firefox allows your desktop, but no audio. That is awful. I am so sorry. See, I, I'm I'm using Microsoft Edge right now for the for the whole experience, Jack. And uh we're um you know uh it's it's five by five here. Uh, so maybe if I mute you and then unmute you. Oh, no, no, no. That's okay. Michael, let me tell you something. I, I'm just, I'm going to keep my headphone. I'm going to keep my headphones on and we're going to go to this view and then hopefully, uh, Jack will be able to join us and we'll, we'll zip out. Um, but, uh, I've said before. Twitter, uh, RPG Twitter is fine. 
No, it 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 really is. I I I haven't. Um, yeah, I've I've got I've got no mic from you, Jack. Um, but uh, our, yeah, RPG Twitter is fine. I have been hanging out on Twitter now for um. You know, I'm I'm just I'm gonna do something here real quick. Uh, for the last couple of days, I just been doing RPG Twitter, and there's no issues at all. Um, I I I haven't come a cropper of of any silliness. Uh, wheelchairs and dungeons aside, but that is a psyop, by the way. I talked to Tim about this. Wheelchairs and dungeons. Let me tell you something. You guys, if you're arguing about wheelchairs and dungeons for or against, you are the victim of a psyop. And I almost feel like I got to go Alex Jones with this. I almost feel like I got to do the Alex Jones here. Those two pieces of spam carved to look like human heads that started up with that horse shit about, um, you know, oh, well, Dungeons and Dragons was made by white men from the Midwest. Ew. They got roundly freaking dragged. Because, guys, that was on the eve of Gary Khan. That is during the year of the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons when they should literally be... Uh, uh, Fitting, um, uh, uh, oh, Michael Dale paid for it. Uh, uh, like effigies of these guys in their honor, and they were getting dragged for it. Then all of the sudden, from the corners of Twitter, from a bunch of people I didn't know, started saying, "Well, wheelchairs and dungeon are a th dungeons are a thing, you know." And where did that come from? How did that become part of the discussion? But let me tell you something. This is what I tried to warn you people about. First, it's wheelchairs in the dungeon. Then the next thing you know, you're going to live in a 15-minute dungeon. You're going to have to eat the bugs. You won't own anything, people, and I'm trying to warn you, but you're not listening to me. They're going to make you eat the bugs. You're going to have to live in a WEF-controlled dungeon. You'll only be able to adventure when they want you to adventure. You won't own your own horses. The paladin won't get his own war horse. That'll belong to the state. Everybody will only level up when the state says you can level up. We're almost there, people. I'm trying to warn you, but you, you're not listening to me. <laughs> Colloidal silver pieces. Kabuki knows. She knows. So yeah, um, monetization sad horn. Yeah, you guys, I you know I started uh, talking about Alex Jones and doing an impression. So you guys are going to have to super me now uh, to save this video. But um, no, it's a psyop. It's like they said something stupid, and then somebody had to run and say, "Oh, hey, look, wheelchairs in the dungeon. Whoa, whoa you're morons, and you you know you're you're to the right of Genghis Khan if you don't believe." And it's like. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody was arguing the point. It had been settled. Some people didn't like it. Some people did like it. And now people are not talking about the, it. It is literally a can of pennies on a stick that Watsi has control of, and they shake it when they do something stupid. A year ago, a year ago, we were in lockstep and united against Wizards of the Coast. We were united against Wizards of the Coast. It was the worst possible thing for them. Old school people making old school stuff that they were sliding out under Osric and Swords and Wizardry. And people making brand new stuff for 5th edition with all the toppings. We, we, were, we were ready to go to war. 20,000 hardcore members. Can you dig it? And we got distracted by something shiny. 
And as a result, as a result, um, they, they got the initiative back. It took them a long time and God knows they kept screwing up a lot. I mean, you know, I do, go watch the, go watch the videos I did. Go watch all the videos I did of all the mistakes they made. And yeah, there's your next project, Timothy. Do a room conduct a room temperature uh, superconductor. Um. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry, Jack. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. It's like nothing in voice meter. Nothing in voice meter is wonky. So. I promise you, I don't have you muted. Yeah, all, all of my sliders are there. Nothing on my board is, is there. Hey, Kabuki, fusion is coming. In 10 years, we're going to have sustained fusion, okay? Just like they told people in 2013 and 2003 and 1993 and 1983 in 1973, and I think maybe even in 1963, sustainable fusion is just 10 years away. The Mahler flying car of uh, of of um, of uh, energy projects, but um, I will say, and I think this was. <laughs> I am hath sent me. Thank you, Volcano God, for the super. Um, which, to be fair, five bucks is about what I would have made on this video from ads. <laughs> so that's that's fair. I I've more than doubled my ad take in supers tonight. So, um, but what was it? Westinghouse. It was either Westinghouse or um, uh Hitachi, and I can't remember who it was. Um, somebody found a patent. No, I'm almost sure it was it was Westinghouse for a uh, for a a fusion reactor, not fission fusion reactor that could be put on a semi truck and and move not not like. You know, well, we can move it from that lamp to this lamp on a semi truck, but like truck it into a place and set it up, and it's just the size of a of a semi truck trailer. Um, but I mean, you know, with with a with a patent, I think I don't know. Maybe you know, Tim's probably going to start pulling what's left of his hair out if 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 I if I say such a silly thing. But um, um, uh, hey, Kabuki. I'm going to stop you right there before I continue on. Um, there's two kinds of nation in this world. Those that have sent men to the moon and those who use the metric system. Now the engineers in the audience are really pulling their hair out. But no, uh, you know, you can say, hey, here's a patent for a trailer hauled sustainable fusion device. And, you know, you just have a draftsman draw up the trailer and then you just got an arrow pointing to like a giant cylindrical structure, maybe with some Grableys on it that says fusion reactor. And then go out and say, we're putting a patent on this. I know they use metric Kabuki and they also used Imperial. I Timothy, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take exception to that because uh, we based a lot of our rocketry work on the work of Dr. Robert Goddard, who was not a Yahtzee. You know the the dice game where you you match numbers of dice, a Yahtzee, because I can't say the other one. That is demonetization demonetization bill. But anyway, um, moving right along from from uh, things that can get me smacked. Um, half a moment. Did I just, nah, I was just checking to see if I could hear Jack.
Von Halen actually was his name. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack. I mean, I I promise it's it's not it's it's not something it, it it's not anything it's not anything I'm doing, and I don't think it's anything uh, that 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 you yourself are doing. I just I just think Windows has got you has has got you messed up. You know what? I'm gonna okay. We're gonna try something because at the very least, I want Jack to tell us about. His newest project. Uh, let me grab my phone real quick, guys. Bear with me, Jack. Don't go anywhere. Hang on. Jack, I'm going to call you on the phone. And I'm going to put you on speaker, and hopefully we can talk for at least a few minutes. Well, hello there, everybody. All right. Uh, you you got to lower your audio. We're going to get some horrendous feedback, Jack. Yeah, I'll just uh, walk away from that computer there and hang out over here on the other side of the room all right everybody uh is it, it are are we all hearing mr photon you guys out there in the audience let me know yeah hey one two three four five star trek dungeons and dragons what else is there <laughs> nothing as far as i'm concerned all right kabuki is saying kabuki is saying we're hearing you loud and clear so that's uh that's awesome so here we are. We do it old school around here, man. Where there is a will, there is a way. How you been, dude? Welcome to the show, finally. Well, thanks. Let me just say I hate computers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, Engin so much fun. Engine Joe says you sound like a dirty uh, phone prank caller from the 90s. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what was, God, what was it, the Jerky Boys? Oh. <laughs> all, all my coworkers that I worked with at Music Land were into the Jerky Boys back in the '90s. I found that about as funny as dropping a bucket of paint. Uh, yeah, that, uh, I, I kept away from that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I uh, cut my, I cut my teeth on acidic British humor, so all this American stuff is like, what are you people laughing at? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. I mean, I, I I used to have a uh, a coworker uh, back in the Music Land days, and I think. He and I were like uh, the only people who could talk like Britcom stuff to each other. You know, it's, it, everybody else would be going off on current day pop culture. And I'm like, man, Chuck, didn't 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 the end of Black Adder Goes Four choke you up? And he's like, yeah, man, I just that broke my damn heart. You know, it's funny, and, it's, <laughs> and then they die, and, and people are looking at us like, the hell are you people talking about? Yeah, it's a brutal episode right there. It is. That's for sure. It is totally unexpected, totally and completely unexpected. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was funny because it was like the, um, uh, this is, there, there's an urban legend that says only Gary Burkhoff knew the lines he was going to say to the rest of the cast when he went into the OR after Henry's plane supposedly got right. shot down at the end of McLean Stevenson's run on MASH. And that's true, but there was a technical problem, and they had to shoot it twice. So that's not everybody's uh, real I reaction. Didn't, and it was the I didn't hear that. yeah, it, it was the same with uh, with the final episode of Black Adder Goes Forth because the the audience thought it was a send up, and so like they were constantly laughing because we see you know we see the the charge over the top in slow motion. And they in the studio were watching it in high speed and they thought it was a send up. So there was a whole bunch of laughter. So they came back and, and reshot it. So, and so there's your, there, there, there's your, your trivia. So, um, so tell us about the, the new D and D book that you're going to be working on and putting out there. You, you mad genius, you. <laughs> well, uh, the next, set of books in that series is the monster manuals okay. so the last i checked i put the files aside because i needed to knock a bunch of star trek stuff out 
Okay. And I've just about finished that now, so I'll be getting back to the monster manual in weeks or a month or so. So the idea there is MM1, 2, and Fiend Folio, all alphabetized. I have that file, but I haven't looked at it in eight months yet. <laughs> uh, and then I would release three versions. A complete, all monsters, a greater, and a lesser. So the lesser is going to be the stupid monsters like Lava Children and all <laughs> the other worthless well, crap, right? Right. And the greater will be all the better monsters. So if you don't want the huge book, you can at least get all the chop toy, uh, top choice sirloin there for yourself. Okay. Uh, so that's those three. Uh, and there's going to be some Dragon Magazine in there too. One of the things I'm doing with those is coincides with deities and demigods. I'm going to rearrange that by ethos. So if you're a good cleric, you don't need <clears throat> to search through every pantheon. You can just go to the chaotic good plane and pick out all the gods listed there will be chaotic good. Interesting. What I'm going to do about the any worshiper gods, I don't know yet. Uh, so those will be, so the deities is going to get broken into three books again. Okay. Good, bad, and neutral. And in addition to those, I'm pulling out Devils and Demons from Monster Manual. I'm pulling out uh, the Gith Yankee, Quasi Elementals, Elementals. Anything that is outer plane related is going into the extra planar books. Okay. So based on their uh, their prime. Uh, resident plane essentially, so like the Gith Yankee or what lawful evil, so okay. they should be in the evil, but they hang out on the astral plane. So I'm putting them with the neutral and the astral plane guys. Uh, what else? And then after that, it's the DM's guide, and whatever's left of that, uh, that's going to get cut into another couple books that's going to get merged with Dungeoneers and Wilderness Survival Guide. Those are two books I never had back in the day because I thought they were worthless, and they pretty much are. Yes. But but there are a couple paragraphs here and there out of those hundred whatever pages that are, in fact, useful. So uh, those all get chopped up into a new DM's guide, which is going to be called the Codex of Infinite Games. And if you're over at that Internet Archive site and you flip open any one of those three D&D books that's there now, the back pages will detail everything that I just said, essentially. Wow. Well, that that is that that's a Herculean task, dude. That is I mean, I, I, I salute you when I say mad genius. I don't just throw that around. Uh, just, just as, just as a fun thing to say, because mad genius is a fun thing to say, but I mean, that, that's, that's not a small amount of work. You must be driving yourself like an engine. No, it's definitely not a small amount of work. Uh, I mean, it's not difficult. Uh, it does take some time. So here and there, uh, I used to do desktop publishing as a profession for several years. So the mm -hmm. skills are there for me. It's just passion project stuff. And it was all born out of the need to consolidate and alphabetize the spell books. And if you have the alphabetized spell book, then you may as well throw together all the unearthed the canon player handbook characters. And if you do that, you may as well do this. And if you do that, then you may as well do the other. And yeah, you know, it goes from there essentially. Okay. Okay. So, so, you know, it's, it's like a uh, tugging on the, on the, the, uh, the strand on the sweater, just everything just starts to, to come out into your hands then. Yeah. I mean, essentially I could stop now. The player's handbooks are done, but you know, why not do the monster manual? Because that's such a pain in the ass to flip through all three books. Yeah. And you know, find the monster you want. Oh, and from the GM's guide, I'm pulling out all the monster charts. So all the experience stuff, all that's going into the monster books. Very, very handy. And uh, I'm guessing you're going to do sort of a, uh, is they did this like when Fiend Folio dropped, they did a new um, Wandering Monsters table. And then when Monster Manual 2 dropped, they did a new Wandering Monsters table. Right. So I'm going to take whatever is the most current upstate version of those, eliminate the redundancy, 
and then pull in whatever encounter tables from the DM's guide and put those in the monster manual, the XP, the treasure charts, and all that. Uh, just because that's kind of sort of where it belongs, but you know, people always complain about how those old books were organized, and I never had a problem. But if you're going to reorganize them, you got to reorganize them. So <laughs> right on, right on. Well, that is uh, that th that sounds like a fantastic task, and something I'm curious about. When you talk about um, tucking into deities and demigods, of course, uh, and I, I mention this to you, and of course to the audience, because uh, when it, when it comes to the the topic of abandoned wear, I am I am very much a proponent of uh, you know, look, if you leave your car on the on the shoulder of the public highway. You know, and you, and you just leave it there for 20 years. Don't bitch when you come back and it's up on blocks, right? Um, and when it when it come when when you you talk about uh, abandoned wear in terms of D and D, I definitely think that things like the super duper ultra hyper rare uh, modules that not even Wizards of the Coast has copies of in their vaults anymore, or the unexpurgated deities and demigods both fall under that same purview. They're not going to print it again. It's not available anymore in print it, unless you have the excellent, excellent, excellent PDF that's floating around on the web. So are we going to see uh, the more cocky and Lovecraftian uh, monsters and gods in your, uh, your, your book of deities and so on? Yes. Good. That's that's so, wonderful. I've got I'm I bought a normal copy of Deity so I could rip that up and scan it all new proper. Mm -hmm. And I have my original second edition print of Deities that I'm going to gently open and fold and scan and then clean up for Cthulhu and Morcock there. Excellent, excellent. And I will I will more than than gladly share the uh the uh the PDF I've got because it it, it's pretty crispy, dude. It is. Yeah. If, if, if you don't, if you don't have that PDF, it is uh, somebody either did some insane job of retypesetting uh, a deities and demigods, or they sacrificed one. They just said, "Look, you know, this thing is destroyed on the outside, or whatever." Because this is not like, yeah, I held it down really hard on my UMAX scanner. This is <laughs> each page separated. And laid flat on on a uh, scanner, or even you know done with a drum scanner, which I, you you probably know what that is, right? Right. Yeah. And what I've been doing for my setup is I bought all the books, which cost me about five hundred dollars. <laughs> and uh, I've been razor blading all the uh, spines, scanning each page, cleaning each one by hand, mm -hmm. and then bringing them into the layout from there. So they're all going in at 600 DPI. Nice. And then there is some cleaning damage as far as the procedural aspects go. Mm -hmm. And I could go in and do every single dust hit, but procedural methods, you know, they, they work a little faster. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, there is some loss in quality in that regard, but the 600 DPI masters make it better than anything else that's out there now, certainly. And then being organized the way they are, you just can't pick up any other book and get fighter cavalier, you know, and yeah. all these barbarian right in the same inline road right there. So right that's on. the big thing. And what I've been realizing is this is first and a half edition D and D. Right? right. So first edition D and D is the first three books and essentially maybe deities. Maybe. I I I include deities in there. I think deities People overlook it and they think it's just like a monster manual full of gods to kill. It's not. There are essential right. AD&D rules in that book. Even if, even if Jim had just whole cloth, put Greyhawk deities in it, it's still core AD&D to me. Right. To me. And then Fiend Folio is kind of in between. And then when on Earth Darkana hit, that's first and a half edition right there. Everything that happens until second edition hits. Right. Right. So... If you guys want to play first edition, you're hanging out with Bill. If you want to play first and a half edition, go for all of these books here. Or if you want the extra spells, like maybe Bill will say, okay, yeah, you can use Thunder Arcana spells, but you can't play the classes. 
Right. So you got all those spells right there for yourself. And I think there is ample utility in Unearthed Arcana that I, it should be on on a first edition fan shelf. I just don't like the classes and I don't like the fact that Drow are playable. Um, <laughs> but, but stuff like... Uh, they're so because you go through the classic, you know. I, I've got like the the Led Zeppelin album, uh, Led Zeppelin discography of classic AD and D modules. But there's so many times when you know guys like uh, you know Hammock and Cook and and uh, you know whoever was writing modules, you know Tom Moldvay or uh, you know Skip Williams, whoever they'd come up with a spell or they'd come up with a procedure. Like there are swimming procedures in probably four or five of those modules that are completely different from each other. And uh, like G1 uh, or G123, I can't remember if it's in, if it's in the uh, past LG one, but uh, G123 has the spell uh, crystal brittle in it. Gary came up with that. And back then, you know, it's 1981, everything's set. You want the spell crystal brittle? Well, you gotta, you know, you you gotta keep your copy of G one around to use as a rule book for any player who might get crystal brittle or if it winds up on a scroll. Um, and so, what you're doing and and bringing all that stuff together, uh, and particularly, uh, you know, again with unearthed arcana, uh, having all that stuff to hand is awesome. Like, I I still, uh, it it was such a hassle when I was a kid. And there was this massive list of what it cost to get a cleric to cast a spell. Nothing for magic users. And then, you know, it, it came in Unearthed Arcana, which, again, shows its worth. And then all the magic items that came along, again, in modules, in Dragon Magazine, like, you know, like just the, the simple plus one dagger has no XP or experience or, uh, or gold value given in any AD&D book except Unearthed Arcana. So, so that yeah, is, uh, that. yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's very good for a lot of common stuff that you might think, uh, is just, um, is, oh, well, this is in the dungeon master guide. No, it's not. It's an, it's an unearthed arcana. So anything you do with that to, to bring that into a, you know, into a form, uh, I don't care what edition you call it. One, <laughs> 1. 1.3, 1. 1.5 is, is okay by me. Um, so good yeah, on so, you for that. Uh, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, so there's two or three things in there. Uh, it's like with Arcana, the classes got and spells got pulled out into the Librem of Gameful Conjurations. Uh -huh. The DM section is getting pulled into the Codex of Infinite Games, where that belongs. There's some deities in Arcana, so those are getting pulled out of that. So that book is getting entirely ripped apart and getting sorted to where it belongs excellent excellent and then something like the dm's guide uh there's talk about the alignments in there and what they are but there's mm -hmm. also talk in the player's handbook about what the alignments and they are so i just pulled the alignments out of the dm's guide and put those in the player's book because it should be in one place and that's fully information that should be open to the players uh is there's nothing secret about the alignment stuff that's written in the dm's guide it's just a rehash of what it says but a little different than expanded in the player's handbook so uh those are all now together there so it's just pulling bits and pieces of everything from everywhere and kind of patching it all together into hopefully something that makes more sense and will become a valuable reference no matter what to whoever games these old games anymore Excellent, man. And, you know, I, I've, I've shown those, uh, we had, uh, you remember it was the last time I had Heidi and Eric on, but I, they, they were, they were super impressed with, with the, with those volumes. And I said, cause they're like, I teased people on Twitter when I, when I first got, uh, the, um, the Librem, you know, I just, I just took a picture holding, you, you know, just like a bookstore copy. And I said, man, I can't believe how lucky I was to find this. And in such good condition, <laughs> Who, who remembers when you got your first copy? Dude, people went bonkers. They were like, where did you, what is, huh, wait, no, is it, is this Photoshop? And people were like, oh, that has to be Photoshop. Yeah, you can see archive, you, you can see, uh, you can see um, artifacts on it. And yeah, they, they were going bonkers. I, I let them off the hook after a little while. 
but there were a couple hours when when folks were like, uh, I would like to know where to buy this book. I did. It was this a U.S. only release, and it was it was it was a lot of fun. I want to I want to hit a couple of questions. Uh, some people had asked me uh, a few things. Yeah, Real, I, I can't read comments at all where I'm standing. So I I, I understand. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Michael Dale. Uh, oh, we were talking about abandoned where Michael Dale said, uh, do you, do I have the pieces of the SSI companion set? Yes, I do. Uh, the dungeon master's assistance volume one and two are actually really easy to get rolling under DOS box. I'll do a show about that. Uh, you know what? I'll do it next Wednesday. Cause Kyle won't be here. Uh, the downside to your abandoned where note is that it's still under copyright. Of course it, it, it absolutely so is. I mean, the only issues going on there. yeah, if, 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 if you know, a judge and an attorney do not give a flying damn what your what your feeling and your heart and your emotions say about abandoned where there that term does not exist in any legal lexicon. So, folks out there, if you're thinking, well, Bill said abandoned where was okay to pirate. No, I didn't. <laughs> you, you are you are taking any legal risk on yourself. Um, but uh, Michael Dale, I will do a uh, video about uh, about the software now as far as the gold box games the ssi gold box games um audience those are available on good old games on gog um it's like 5.99 for all 12 games or something insane and they come pre-packaged and they'll run on a modern pc at the appropriate speed uh so avail yourself of those they're great games um kabuki asked me are the ssi programs written in basic i know for the commodore 64 a lot of routines were written in basic, but a whole bunch of it was written in ASM, was written in uh, Commodore 64 assembler that loads after basic stuff runs. Like, like the basic is running the assembler code in the background underneath the basic. It was wild, the things they had to do back then. And finally, Kabuki asked, where's my physical graffiti vinyl? It's on the shelf over there. Uh, so fear not. I, I, I treated myself. I, have, have you bought any new vinyl? Lately? Are you a vinyl guy uh, at all, Jack? Uh, no, not in, uh, I don't know how long now, decades, I suppose it would be. I think my last vinyl was Rush Counterparts, actually. Well, that, that, is, that is a fine, fine piece of vinyl to own. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I swung by the mall yesterday to pick up an order from my wife and... Um, there, there, there is a record, uh, uh, FYE for air entertainment. It's a media store, you know, they, they sell Funkos and anime dolls and stuff like that, but they also, uh, they sell records and CDs and, and DVDs and they, they had a pretty full selection of good records. And I looked under L and they had the entire Led Zeppelin catalog. So I treated myself and I bought a copy of physical graffiti on vinyl. And as I said to the young lady who rang me up, the last time I was in this mall and bought a record, uh, well, let's just say the price I'm paying for this one today, I could have gone home with five <laughs> back then. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so, so let's, uh, let's see here. Any, any comments? Um, are the Sewell and Flan pantheons going to be included? So, are we getting Greyhawk deities in your in your deities book, Jack? Yes, the Greyhawk gods will go in there definitely. Uh, well, there you go. Um, it be a separate book of heroes. I'm not sure yet because I suppose that's where all the more type stuff would mostly go. Or uh, King Arthur would need to be a hero. Gilgamesh, uh, right? And has a couple heroes in there, I guess. So I may have to separate those out as well. But right, right on. All the Greyhawk, all the Greyhawk guys will be there, definitely by alignment. Okay, okay, and um, so along those same lines. So in the uh, second edition, in Monster Manual two, it's got a number two in it. So I, I was, I, I, I was not that wrong. In Monster Manual two. And also in um, in the Greyhawk books, Gary did catalog some demons and devils and demigods and heroes that he gave no stats for. Literally, he gave gender panthe uh, 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 gender um, what do you call it domain uh, alignment and name, and that was it. Are you going to reproduce that, or are you just going for stuff that there's hard numbers for? No, whatever 
whatever's in those books, and I'm not going to chop anything out whatsoever. Okay. Uh, okay. If any, I'm just going to add as much as possible until the seams burst, essentially, and it becomes a new thing. Excellent, excellent. And I, speaking of stuff, because you know, Jack, you don't have enough to do. I, I, I find your lackadaisical attitude towards things kind of uh, troubling. So I have not forgotten. Can I reach it without making a fool? Hang on. I have not forgotten. We have a little wheeling and card dealing to do yet. You're decking many things. Yes. Right? So we're. Uh, I. I. It. It is on me, dear listeners and viewers. Uh, I am going to be scanning the deck of many things from Dragon. Uh, what is that? One thirty-eight or one eighty-three? This is uh, neither. One forty-eight. Uh, so I'm scanning the daunt from one forty-eight after I delicately pry it out. Uh, and so Jack's going to have a, uh, a limited run of those cards you're going to do. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So, um, keep, keep your eyes open, uh, on, on eBay and such. Like if you want your own deck of many things, which the scramble to own a physical copy of the deck of many things is odd to me, uh, from a DMing standpoint, because it, that's like, um, I want a 3D printed machine of Lum the Mad to use on my desktop or to use on my uh, tabletop for games. How often will you need that? <laughs> how tell me, Dungeon Masters out there, how often are you screwing your players with a DOMT that you need a physical one just lying around to break out that often? But I think it's wonderful that you're printing, and I can't wait to have one, especially if I don't have to chop up the one in the uh, issue of Dragon. And fortunately, it is stapled, so I can just bend those out and put it on the old flatbed. So, um, so that's uh, that's good. Daniel Rowan says a deck will uh, derail a campaign faster than anything. Um, I didn't have it. I I I have had it, it pop up in a couple of games. A couple of times, the party was like, "Absolutely not, we ain't touching that thing." Um, other times, I've had each character draw a card. Only one character got completely screwed. Uh, he wound up with the void, and uh, his body was still alive. Uh, the party put it in a sanitarium in uh, in uh, Greyhawk and said, well, we'll try and find his soul someday. And I said to myself, I'm going to say his soul was transported into a computer bank on the Starship Warden. And I was really looking forward to someday having them find his you know, him uh, kind of Spock's brained into a uh, in in into one of the the computer banks on the Starship Warden, but that campaign broke up. So sorry, Kamal, you were never rescued. Um. So um, is it? But yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to the deck of of many things, and I think that's going to be. I think that's going to be a ton of fun. And it, it will certainly be better than Wizards of the Coast's uh, attempts. I'm not sure if you if you caught the videos where they were having so many QC problems with that. Oh yeah, yeah. I caught a little of that there. Right. Here, I'm gonna I, I'm actually I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna blow you up. I'm gonna see if I can uh, make you uh, yeah, so let's check that out. What are we looking at there? That's the contents for the spell book. I was just flipping around. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions about this stuff, but I could certainly answer them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, uh, Michael Mertig said, I caught a video from the D&D channel, and they talked about changing or adding to the deck of many things. Same thing. Yeah, Michael, they've... Uh, th they've... Um, They've radically altered the deck of many things. It's good. They're now saying now. I want you guys to think about what is a deck of cards. It it, it is a random. It, it is a a random number generator essentially. Um, randomness is not lawful. Randomness and and the, with the exception of whether or not you're playing with a a deck of. 33 or 23 or whatever it is versus the deck of 19. Um, the deck of many things is not good. But lo and behold, they told some author that she could say that her paladin invented the deck of many things. Of course, 
the way modern D and D is, I like a paladin doesn't that doesn't mean anything anymore. You know, it's all postmodern. It's all you know, nothing has any meaning. Nothing is aspirational. We don't build up the new. We tear down the old. So, yeah, they they've added and changed a lot. Um, let me see. Uh, I just I want to scroll up. Let's see. Um, any questions you guys have got? Uh, so while while we have Jack on the phone, <laughs> you guys please please let me uh, let let me know. Um, maybe one when I was babbling before you we were able to get you on the horn. Uh, Soul and Flame Pantheons. Yes, we already answered that. Um, let's see. <laughs> Mercury Wells, yes. Um, all right, so you guys just 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 pipe up and let me know. Uh, Michael Fraker asks, and I think this is a good question. I want your take on this, Jack. Uh, Michael Fraker asks, uh, why are why is there any lore rules at all in D and D? DM just says what is and isn't true in their own world. I think now this is just me and Jack. I want to know your opinion on this. I think that's fine. I think that's okay of saying rules are lore agnostic. But I feel like, um, and, and this this is just my love of AD&D shining through, but I feel like um, there is a baked-in gray hawkiness to first edition AD&D that is one of the great spices that makes AD&D so good. And... If you want a lore-free set of Dungeons and Dragons rules, the the rules cyclopedia is like that. But gosh, it's so dry. It is just so dry. And Jack, I want to know your opinion on that. What's your take? Well, uh, I think there's definitely flavors. Uh, working on the Star Trek stuff myself, uh, the rules that Fassa wrote for the TV show do not translate to any other version of Star Trek whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They can't. Uh, just because of the era, the technology, uh, the attitude, essentially. Uh, things change over time. So next generation Star Trek is not original Star Trek, even in terms of rule systems. Right. Uh, at the very end, FASA tried to shoehorn some next generation work into their existing rules. And when you take the Enterprise D and you can try to shoehorn that into rules that are created for the refit during the movies, it just doesn't work. It breaks the system. Uh, skill wise, positions, they changed. You know, security for Lieutenant Worf was also in charge of weapons. and right that used to be sulu and then it became Chekhov in the motion picture and mm -hmm. all right so all these things change around and i imagine just like dnd rules may work between Waterdeep and greyhawk but i don't think they would feel the same maybe or there'd be something about it that would just feel different to me if that's if i'm getting at where we're going with the whole rule as an agnostic thing. Uh, like you couldn't take traveler rules and impose those on a boot hill game. Right, right, right. exactly. If my occasional co-host Kyle was here, he might start up an argument, ah, oh, you just lose, you slug throwers, mate, you know, something like that. Well, but you could win a boot hill game in traveler, but applying traveler rules to a boot hill game specifically, it, the map isn't there, right? It's the conversion issues, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you take a boot hill theme and you put that into Traveler, it works great. Yeah. Traveler is like the overall plug anything into it and you got a game going. Even Dungeons and Dragons works in Traveler if oh. you want it to. <laughs> yeah, and I mean so so many of the, the great science fiction movies are just space westerns anyway. You know, uh, um, I, they they lifted from so many westerns and Star Wars that you can't even keep up with it. And then you've got stuff like uh, that completely gonzo and absolutely rewatchable over and over again. Battle Beyond the Stars by Corman. You know, those are westerns set in space. So, but yeah, no, I I, I definitely see where where you're uh, where you're coming from. Um, but I, I am I'm very much 
from an enjoyment standpoint of having background that that you know a, a background that is marinated in in uh in the rules you know I, I i i like that a lot i don't like like here's your fantasy toolkit enjoy i i'm a buddy have you ever played hero system jack no yeah it, I remember it, but no. Yeah, it is a pure points by system, and a buddy of mine, uh, love you to pieces, Jeff, but Jeff was uh, a hero system evangelist, and it was like getting cornered by an Amway salesman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, just constant, you know. Oh, but you can do anything. Look, look, uh, you buy a 1D6 uh, armor-piercing, hand-killing attack, and you add your strength, and... Wait, where are you going? You know, and I, I'm just like, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about this. Um, Gerps was supposed to be, yeah, like general, yeah, essentially, yeah. I never I, got into that either, but I knew it tangentially. Yeah, I, I, I just, I feel like let, I'm very much let a game be for the system it is. I, I would rather, you know. I, I I would rather play a clunky uh, game like um, like Mechton from our Talsorian or Mech Warrior from Fossa that are obviously built for characters who are going to pilot giant robots than try and make uh, you know an everything cake where it's like oh no you can do anything with this system because you know how it goes uh, you know. Uh, you know, jack of all trades, no pun intended, master master of absolutely none. And if by having a game that is so masterful means that the flavor goes into it too, then so be it. That's just my attitude. That's 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 just my 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 hot take on it. So um so once we have the rule books and the 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 deck of many things and a project, I want to just we're not I don't want to talk about this top secret. You guys don't have clearance out there in the audience. Um, but what is your next big serious project after these, Jack? Um or, uh, or do you have your sights set on anything? Well, there's always hobbies, right? Uh right. The main reason I got back into doing this is because I wanted to run Star Trek games again back around 2020. And if I was going to do that, I needed to clean up the FAFSA system. And then last year, I was watching an episode with you, and that reminded me that decades ago, I tried to alphabetize the spell books. And I was like, oh, I'm getting sick of Star Trek for a little bit. Why don't I pick up this D&D real quick and uh, just twiddle there for a bit? And all of a sudden... <laughs> There's a whole new project on my desk that I couldn't have imagined before. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you've you've definitely uh, got a full plate. But now I don't want to put you on the spot, and I'm certainly not going to do that. We had kind of possibly kicked around the idea of maybe a little bit of uh, maybe a little bit of uh, Jack Photon Star Trek uh, in a virtual sense. Um, some of the audience were like, "Hey." Would Jack run a Star Trek game on the show? And I'm not going to speak for you. I'm sorry. I'm certainly not. I'm not going to speak for you, Jack. But I, I'm just saying, some folks in the audience were were kind of mentioning that as kind of a neat thing. Um, would Would you Would you maybe come and run a guest game of Star Trek for us, perhaps in the future? Yeah, I'd say. How about later in the year when you got a Gamma World break going on? Or there's you don't do travel on Wednesdays anymore, but uh, we'll say Sci Fi Fridays. Uh, yeah, so you gotta want to take a break for several weeks. I uh, figure week one we can go over the rules because they really need to be gotten into. Week two, we'd all roll up characters so that everybody could see the process and go through it with us all and start the game if we can, and then week. Three would be the majority of the game, and week four is cleanup. <laughs> if that's reasonable to you guys. Well, audience, what do you say? If you guys want to want to have Jack on the show running some Star Trek after we, uh, you know, we, we we let the brakes cool, you know, 
we 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 kind of pull off to the side let the engine cool let the brakes cool down a little bit and let jack truck us up the highway for some fossa star trek i want to hear from you guys uh so let me know and jack i'll um I'll, I'll make the arrangements. We'll get we'll get a group. We got we got to solve this technical problem because I'm not sitting like this for two hours. Oh, yeah. I got to tell you oh, what. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, go ahead. No, yeah. I was just going to say, wonderful Wizard of Games is already saying uh, saying uh, some Star Trek would be awesome. Um, Daniel Rowan would like to see it. Or hey, Ureeb, Orbital Air, uh, Grimlor. Um, yeah, yeah, we we're getting a pretty good audience response. I think we could probably do some fossa star trek here uh in the future not you know the 22nd century future but sooner than that so we'll uh give me the red shirt <laughs> i i'm the host i can i can uh you know what what is it destruct one destruct two kirk identify on you guys with a single push of a button so jack wouldn't dare um <laughs> I, I gotta clear up one misconception right now that has haunted the star trek community and the world at large let's hear it red shirts are the safest color to wear whatsoever oh yeah i've seen that breakdown so so tell i i have actually seen this discussed before and this this is kind of cool um do, do you have the numbers or, sh or shall we we just uh kind of explain it uh experientially to the audience jack so i've gone through it all a couple times what i'm doing now is i'm notating every single episode who dies and under what conditions and what their name was and what it's coming down to is yellow is the most lethal color to wear unless you're a woman okay so if you're wearing yellow and you're a guy you are the most in danger of dying on a landing party situation. Men in blue, followed by women in blue, are the next lethal, followed by red, uh, red skirts, shirts, skirts, women, uh, and then followed by red-shirted men. They are the safest because they are the most of them. They have safety in numbers. There you go, guys. It's just it's it's pure numbers, and I love breakdowns like that because not 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 to get too real world here. It's, you know, we, we like to keep things light, but um, so pretty much since the end of the Second World War up until really the last few years, there has been this myth that American tanks in Europe in World War II, for all like you know, le less less than a year that they were there, um. That, that that they were rolling coffins you know there's a death sentence to be in a tank and there's this awesome 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 guy um uh, he goes by the chieftain on youtube and he he talks about armor he's he's an uh, irishman who's naturalized u.s citizen and he joined the tank corps because in his words well you had the abrams tanks in uh in in the united states and ireland didn't have them i wanted i wanted to be a tank commander um so he, he came to the United States and, and became a tank commander in the U.S. Army. And he, so he did a breakdown about the myth of American armor. And, like, you were far, far and away by percentage numbers uh, and, and, and all other kinds of demographics more likely to suffer a fatal injury as an infantryman or on the crew of a bomber or on the crew of a u.s submarine than you were serving in a uh in, in a sherman and people talking about you know oh well oh they use gasoline and they suffered all these burns. the german tanks used gasoline their crews suffered worse burns <laughs> than, than u.s tank. but but and there it all comes down to they're basing it on one meme one book started by uh uh a guy who wrote a book called death traps well, this dude was in, he was in a Sherman maintenance depot. What did he see all day? Blown up Sherman tanks. And, and he based it all on that. So with Star Trek, it's, 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 you know, people created this meme. Oh, red shirts are all going to die. They're, you know, the horde is going to eat the red shirts and they're basing it on, you know, one or two little clips that they see. But as Jack points out, everybody, red shirts, safe as dudes. Yeah, so here's like an extreme example, the apple with uh, Vol. 
three red shirted security guys one blows up one lightning strike one takes a club to the back of the head the red skirted yeoman survives so there's 75 percent fatality rate for them out of that encounter let's go to something like uh, galileo seven three blue two red two yellow 100 percent lethality for the yellow yeah. Oh, and in the apple, Spock in the blue shirt takes a lightning bolt to the back. So uh, I'm counting damage like that too. Spock actually he gets lightning bolt to the back. He gets shot in the back uh, by a rifle. He he gets his ass kicked throughout the series. Gets his brain pulled out of his head. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. 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 It's it's uh you're 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 absolutely right. And uh, also there there's a. Uh, there's a side thread growing in the in the comments where people are talking about Imperial Stormtroopers. Look, guys, Imperial Stormtroopers were ordered to not shoot at so they could escape. So they could escape. Can you imagine being the guy? Darth Vader would straight up choke a fleet admiral for, for bad mouthing him. Can you imagine being the stormtrooper who accidentally shot Hannah Lou? Right. You know, you talk you talk about. Oh, well, the stormtroopers aren't precise. Look how close they got to shooting them and didn't hit them. Or the TIE fighters at the end giving them chase. The, yeah, going out there. Yeah, well, we're going to go out. We're going to shoot the ship, but we're going to shoot the ship in a way that won't blow it up. And, and then we're, we're... They let us get away. Yeah, we, we, we have to die, but that's, that's, part, that's part of the kayfabe. No, stormtroopers are not bad shots, and red shirts are not just disposable, uh, disposable characters. That yes, haha, ha, funny memes. That ain't true. That ain't, and that's not like extended universe or Star Trek novel stuff. This is what you see on screen. This this is what is actually on screen. So you think in 1960 the women might be safe, but no, several of them get uh, they get the axe too. It's amazing. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, by any other name, um, when they when they meet the the Andromedans and uh, dude turns two Trek crew members into uh, into the 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 and cubes. Yeah, he he cru he crushes one. That was the woman that got pulped when when he reconstituted him. That was the female crewman that got crushed to death and is never coming back. So. And it, Deadly Ears, uh, Lieutenant What's Her Name in the blue dress. Yeah. Croaked. He was the first one to die. There's uh, one or two others, I think, but they're not common. Women are mostly safe, but yeah, they, they still take their heads. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and then the, oh, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to mention, um, uh, oh, uh, what it, uh, when Daystrom hooked the M5 up to uh, the the uh, the Enterprise, and it went through its war maneuvers, like it, it like damaged two other Enterprise uh, or Constitution class ships badly enough that their crews were totally wiped out. Can you imagine a U.S. Navy exercise where just a thousand people <laughs> are killed today? Right. So yeah, it was not um, it. it it, it, it ain't red shirts, guys. It ain't red shirts. Uh, Daniel Rowan wants to know. We're actually building up questions here for you, uh, Jack. What is your favorite original series episode? Well, you know, it changes all the time, of course. But I think given the times we now live in, Day of the Dove is most reflective and my favorite for what's going on. We seem to have some kind of evil psionic monster that's perpetrating a lot of evil between otherwise good people all across the world. And I don't know, we got to start laughing and making fun of that shit. Otherwise, things could get real bad is all I got to say. And there's definitely lessons to be learned in those old shows. Yeah. I'm pulling them today. Uh, is it, uh, I can't remember the commander's name. Is it Kolos? Uh, Only a fool fights in a burning house. Dang. Kang, thank you, Kang. Um, Earlier on in that episode, he's saying when he gets Kirk, he's going to have his head stuffed on the cabin wall. and Yeah. And that's some serious stuff. They're, 
Scott, oh, at the end, when they go on the whole racist diatribe with Skabak, holy cow, what a powerful moment. Yeah. Powerful stuff in that episode, folks. I'm going to say that currently uh, my my current favorite is uh, A Taste of Armageddon. Mm. Always a good one. Anon's just impassioned. This is a guy who's horrified by what's going to happen within hours if if the enterprise crew doesn't doesn't let themselves be killed he he's not just like some maniac he's like you could he is terrified out of his mind at what kirk's going to do and kirk's basically like, you're not going to emotionally blackmail me and you're going to stop killing millions of people every year and and call it uh call it all good and happy uh i don't know if there's a modern lesson for that or not but it's it's a damn fine episode um uh, that's a very modern lesson for that because it's war run by computers. Yeah. I wonder what you've heard of that before. Hmm? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can you can log on to YouTube tonight and watch a dozen videos of soldiers from either side in a cur- current conflict going on in uh, the uh, deep southeast slash east Europe area, and I'm not going to name any names, and see soldiers uh, being unalived by machines. And you do it from the comfort of your own home, and you say, oh, well, you know, that happens. Yeah, so instead of reporting to syndicator booths like all good citizens do, it's a wholly different issue. And holy is W-H-O-L-L-Y, not the other one. Yeah, yeah. Um, best original series cast movie? Oh, yeah, that's that's easy. That That's Wrath of Khan. That I, oh, did I just say something bad? Dun, dun, dun. No, what 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 was yours? What was yours? The motion picture. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, the motion picture is my favorite of the six. Definitely. Khan is great. I love Spock. Voyage Home is a lot of fun. But the motion picture, for me, is the summation of all that Star Trek was. The search, the crisis the impending doom, the beyond imagination alien life form that ultimately turns out to be us. Pure Star Trek right there. Absolutely. Everybody complains it's slow, it's stupid, it's boring. No, 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 no. Not for me. I like it. In in fact, in order, I tend to go uh, um, Rathacon Undiscovered Motion Picture. Um, and then the rest, uh, but, um, I, so I think motion picture is awesome. And I think you're right. If motion picture had been a two-parter in the original series, because the, you know, I get, I don't, maybe it's because of what two and then subsequent episodes did or subsequent films did tonally. By taking right. it, taking it from, you know, I am your captain, you are my crew, I give orders, you obey, um, which is how a lot of the early original series was. But when we picked it up with two, it was we're we are a space family and we love each other. We truck around having space adventures, and it was a lot warmer. If they had kept the tone of motion picture. Then yeah, I, I I would say, but they they set us up in later films for the idea that these are warm human people starting to reach middle age, and you know they're kind of going through midlife crisis and enjoying each other and joshing around less than look. This is a military starship, you know, it can lay waste to multiple planets before it has to go back for a refit and rearm. And I'm in charge of stopping uh, a solar system sized spacecraft that is eating every planet that, that comes near it. So I, I see where you're coming from. The light of later movies kind of casts a shadow on motion picture. But with that said, for pure, for pure chutzpah, for pure gravitas, well, not for pure gravitas, but for pure chutzpah and fun and Horatio Hornblower in space, two is is my favorite. I would say that essentially the motion picture is essentially a denouement 
to the old ways, right? Yeah. And Wrath of Khan is essentially the first movie, if you look at it that way. And yes, exactly. Probably, exactly. Part of the issue with motion picture is that it was going to be the second Star Trek series, and then Paramount yanked it around, and they wanted a movie because of Star Wars, and it was written for a TV show, and they had to change it, and all this it was a mess on the production side of everything. And that's why we got what we got essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's, that's, uh, th it, it's, it's interesting. We could probably do an entire two hour show just talking about Star Trek new voyages. Um, yeah. but, uh, we show every now and then just Bill and Jack and Star Trek. I, 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 w I wouldn't hate it. I wouldn't hate it. Um, but, uh, uh, Bob, you take that back or I'll kick and ban you. Bob is saying Rathacon acting was really bad. Uh, no, I, no, no, we, we, no we don't, we don't say such things. I'm just kidding you, Bob. I'm not going to kick and ban you. You, you say and enjoy what you want. Um, performance, how do you feel young? How do you feel old at the end? His soul was the most human. Oh my gosh. Shocker. Yeah. Totally rocks in that episode. Oh, and, uh, uh, he's good unquestionably and, and you know scotty and this was i this is a cutting room floor thing guys if you get the deluxe dvd uh watch this scene uh the young man that dies in scotty's arms in uh Ravicon is his nephew that is yeah, a really direct <laughs> blood relation he's just just so distraught and james duhan did such a great job and it's it's, it's a tragedy that got left on the cutting room floor I mean, it is the, the acting in Rathacon is is great. Um, Undiscovered Country. I used to love that, but after I watched a few too many times, I was like, "Oh my gosh, there's no logic here whatsoever. Everything falls apart at every turn, and it, the story just does not hold up for me at all." And that starts with a moon being responsible for the entire Klingon Empire's energy projection. It's like, wait, what? A single moon? Really? So, so un Undiscovered Country... <sighs> undiscovered Country was was a fine place to to, uh, to, to, to wrap it up. I, I agree it's got, it's got some... It, yeah, you know, the, oh, this is our singular en energy produ production moon. And uh, I mean, the whole thing is basically, here's how the USSR fell, right? Reactor explosion. Now Chernobyl. we have, yeah, Chernobyl. Now we have to come to terms with you guys. And I, I, I think, um, I, I think, I think it works for that. But no, I, I can, I can see where it would start to wear. But one that holds a special place in my heart, and I may draw a flack from you and fr from the audience for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Is is um, is five? Now, yes, it's terrible. It, it's it's like Spock's brain, kind of not good, but. Um, I, I had a wonderful time seeing it. I went to see it with my dad and my, my, my dad and I watched it. Uh, uh, we, we got like early tickets to go see it from a radio station and we were in there and we were like goofing around with the, the DJs were like throwing out cups and stuff. And, it, you know, I got, I got like a radio station plastic tumbler and I, and he was throwing t-shirts to other people and I just stood up and yelled, I'm a college student. I need clean clothes. Take this back. And I, you know, I threw it and he caught it and threw me a t-shirt, you know, and, and we had a lot of fun. I had more fun at the event than, you know, the movie made any damn look of sense. And I remember, I remember when, when we were on our way out and, uh, out of the theater and my, my pop was like, uh, well, that was about Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I have a fond memory of it, but no, it's it's not a it's not a particularly good Star Trek film. But um, I don't have it. It's the one I've least seen the least. It starts off poorly, doesn't get much better, and then ends badly. However, there are some good moments in there if I remember, like McCoy and his father in that illusion. Yeah, uh, that that was. Kirk denying saying his problems are his own or sins are his own or whatever. Yeah. I, you know, I, I need my pain. It, 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 it's, right. it, it makes me stronger. Um, so there's bits of nice stuff here and there. Definitely. 
the notion of an emotional Vulcan was just like, oh, wait, and then he's his brother, and then, and then it's God, and the center of the game. Well, yeah. Huh? <laughs> and, Slow down. And, I mean, Nichelle Nichols being nude, that was like... It, for if you haven't seen it, guys, it's it, it's in silhouette. You, it's it's not. Don't you know? Don't, don't rush out and get the DVD and pause it. it it's she's she's doing she's doing a like Lieutenant Ohura, one of the one of the most gifted linguists in all of Starfleet. Well, I'll just take a shuttle down to the planet and dance naked and distract the bad guys. That is a tabletop RPG moment right there, where the game master just folds his hands and says, "You're gonna do what?" I'm going to distract them. You know, they've been, they're men. They've been prisoners on this planet for, for, you know, a decade and I'm going to dance naked and that'll distract them. So the rest of the crew can ambush them. Uh, okay. Roll, roll your dancing ability, I guess. Natural 20. They're, they're distracted. They come, they, they drop their guns and run up the dune towards you. You know, it is, it is literally one of those moments. So, know if that went in there because Nichelle back in the 60s was looking at doing a uh, stage performance out in Paris and she almost left Star Trek to go and do that but uh so that may speak that particular scene it's so out of place right like you say it's a total RPG moment only a player would think of that yeah yeah and, but uh, it's some homage to Nichelle's personal art side of things she's saying she danced she did all of these things she was going to make that her career until she landed Uhura and then at a dinner with where Martin Luther King Jr. was yes. right if everyone knows that story he went up to her said he was a fan and it's the only show that his children are allowed to watch yep. and he personally convinced Michelle Nichols she had re she gave Gene Roddenberry her walking papers that Friday. She had the dinner Saturday or Sunday and Monday morning she went in and she said, okay, I'm staying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I, all to Martin Luther King there, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that she stayed and did not go off to Paris for a singing and stage dance career. Although she was dis so the, the way the scene was originally written and this pissed her off and I'm sure you know this story, but in, um, uh, undiscovered country when they rock up on that Klingon outpost the whole thing was you know they get on the comms and there's like some ensign or something at, at communications and you know the Klingons are do his vesh hunuk rin and everybody just kind of freezes well the way it was going to be she just rocks up takes the headset and just fluently wraps out to the Klingons the ship's ID and what they're doing and then just kind of folds her arm and everybody's like holy crap, Uhura, like, flew it Klingon. We didn't know that. And it was going to be this shining moment. But they decided they needed a joke. Oh, God, really? So they played it for a joke. When she, when she oh. yanks the, when she yanks the, uh, the combo thing out of her ear and slams it down on the counter, she was pissed off. That was, oh. like, the best take they got because she, like, did not want to play the scene that way. And when they got one take, and she refused to do it again. She she was like that 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 was disgusting. That was an insult to to the way I pictured Ahura. And she was unhappy about that. What a ripoff. Oh my gosh. No, I did not know that story, definitely. If that's true, that's really that's uh what a shame because that's such a terrible scene <laughs> yeah it's 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 a horrible scene i mean ima imagine jack you and i are supposed to be watching a section of the road we're highway patrolmen and we're supposed to be watching a section of the road for traffic and we get on the cb and we, you know we call a truck that's just kind of slow rolling up the highway and you know we say hey uh you know 18 wheeler with the the roadway uh logo on you it's, you know uh uh, identify yourself and we hear a thickly accented russian voice <laughs> speaking in broken english and hesitating and umming and eyeing yeah. i don't care how drunk you are or uh, uh, you know how how sugar comed we would be from donuts and coffee we're not going to be like okay uh don't get any bugs <laughs> right and then yeah. they're looking through a book really a book where did they get that? It, <laughs> yeah, piles of books. Like, let's just forget that Ahura. At the at the very worst, she could have like pulled up a lexicon. 
Um, so somebody is asking, uh, um, is it so, somebody, somebody was asking about, um, what, what, do you, what do you think of the new shows? The new shows? I haven't watched any. I don't have any special uh, streaming services or anything. So Right, right on. Right on. See, yeah. see I, for... watched, I got Next Generation. I watched bits of Deep Space Nine. I loved the first five minutes of the Voyager pilot. And when <laughs> they killed that original crew, I was like, Psh, what did you guys do? They, they had the Kirk, Spock, McCoy dynamic set up perfect. Yeah. And they go for the fish out of water that they already did with Next Generation and DS9 and every other show to come ever since. And it's like, oh. Yeah. So I just gave up on that at that point. Yeah. And I, I um, was just, you know, I that literally, like, Kirk uh or or i think even mccoy could have figured out well we can't let the we can't let the preservers technology fall into the hands of the kazon fine put a photon torpedo here with a portable shield generator and a timer we'll go back through the wormhole and 30 seconds later or we'll send a squirt transmission not even a timer we'll send a squirt transmission and 30 seconds later this thing is vaporized as is a good portion of the Kazon fleet. And then it's just an episode. Right. You know, but I, I, I was not a V'ger fan. I, d let me tell you, I am such an old fogey. I, I refer to the next generation and everything forward as new Star Trek. And TNG is, is, is older now than the original series was when I started watching the original series when I was eight. Cause the original series was only like, uh, is it 68? I started watching it. So yeah, it, it was, it was literally only like a decade old when I started watching Star Trek when I was a kid. And now, you know, TNG people are like looking back on that with the nostalgia. So that ain't right. me. That ain't me. I, I just, if it's not, it, so do you, I was talking about this earlier. Um, do you consider the animated series just an extension of the original series? Essentially, yeah. See, all right-thinking Star yeah. Trek fans do. Yeah, I got no problem with that. And part of my recompilation of the FASA system is to go and research all of the animated episodes. So I'm going to dig into the Peter Pan records, pull out whatever assets can be pulled from that. I'm going to the Gold Key comics, uh, planets, events, technologies, uh, all that stuff. Man, that is that is that is absolutely amazing. But unfortunately, uh, I've got a uh, twenty-two percent battery left. Um, okay, no worries, man. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think we've well, got to talk a little. That's cool, at least. And hopefully for next time. Oh yeah, next time. Since we only got a minute left. So, oh, did I already go through this with the monster manual? How I'd like to tear it all apart with all of you guys and Bill live on his show some night where we all yay, nay, each monster in order down the list. I love that. You did not, but I love that idea. Let's do that. Let's let's plan to do that a little bit later this spring, my friend. That sounds like a lot of fun. And in the few moments we've got left, let me ask you, uh, would you maybe consider running some Trek at the Great Underground Online Gaming Convention? I can't be ready in time. Oh, no. okay. Okay, I understand. You have a lot of irons in the fire, but hopefully we can get that uh, uh, on air then. We can get that Jack Photon Trek goodness. So Next year for the Glock could certainly be a possibility, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to unload all that stock from last year and uh, on this year's folks <laughs> that I sent you. Nice, nice, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, anybody who didn't get, you know, and I, when I say didn't get, I don't mean like, oh, it's been sitting around and I haven't sent it. I sent out emails to everybody whose name I drew, to those of you who won stuff and didn't get back to me. I'm sorry. It's going back in the prize kitty, and we're having another drawing, a live drawing, Sunday night after the Glock. If you're not in stream, I'm not. I'm not. I, your your name's not going in the hat. So I'm just going to have to let you know. Patty wants to know if I'm at Gary Con. No, I'm not at Gary Con, and I won't be at Gary Con. 
Uh, I don't have that kind of scratch, uh, and I certainly don't have the the time, unfortunately. So, um, Jack, thank you so much. Uh, sorry about the audio issues, but we made it work. We've been, we've been going for like an hour and change now, believe it or not. So it wasn't it wasn't a small interview this time. So uh, thank you. On this, that's totally at my end. I like I said, I hate computers, and I'm sure I've got something disabled somewhere in something that's totally screwing me over. So, <laughs> well, we'll we'll get it figured out. Next time, we'll 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 do a dry run uh, before we have you on the show, and uh, and I, I'll I'll help you troubleshoot whatever audio. But thank you for for going the extra mile. And uh, thank you, of course, to our audience for being here, guys. Uh, I'm going to have Jack. I'm sorry. Thanks, everybody, for uh, sticking around through all the uh, hassle and turmoil. Yeah, um, I will, uh, uh, everyone, I will add in the description to this video below uh, uh, later, I will add Jack's archive.org link. Uh, look for his stuff on, on eBay. Where, where, can they, where can they find your stuff on eBay when you occasionally put up uh, hard copies, uh, Jack? Uh, if they just search Librem of Gameful Conjuration right now, they'll find one set of books put there. It's a soft cover. But uh, my 13 by 19 printer has to go in for warranty work, so I'm not going to be able to print up any new covers anytime soon. So that's the last edition for a few months at least, if not the summer. Well, okay, guys. So uh, grab them if you want them on eBay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you go, Jack, and we're going to wrap up the show. Thank you for being here, sir. Definitely appreciate the uh, extra mile you went, and everybody have a good night out there. All right, peace, my friend. All right, you too, man. Take mm -hmm. care. Bye -bye. bye. So there we go, guys. We made it work. We 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 bridged the technology gap, and we made it work this evening. And I'm so glad that we were able to sort that out. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to uh, uh, thank you, Vaughn, for the super. Thank you, Michael Dale. Uh, and, uh, thank you, Volcano God. I really, really appreciate the supers guys. They literally help keep the lights on around here. Um, so tomorrow night we are going to be playing some gamma world and I hope you guys will be here, uh, for Jim. I'm going to, I'm just going to disintegrate and mutate them all for the rest of you guys for your entertainment. Um, I love you all. I'll see you tomorrow night and, uh, Scotty beam aboard an owl bear. Peace. Have you seen my owl bear? Here's to all the weirdos everywhere in the woods and in the air. Have you seen my owl bear? Should I shave off all my hair? Bobs are all around. Some live in tunnels underground. Some are fat, some are rich, some are sleeping in a ditch. Can you ride a crooked horse without a saddle way off course? Naked as a toad, all the way to Smoky Joe's. Have you seen the little creep driving fast in his little green jeep? He smells like fish and brandy. But his rotten teeth look dandy. Take me to the show. I don't care if fast or slow. From action flicks to dancing dicks, just take me 